in and through these requests. God, there might be some people here that are saying, you know what, God, I'm going to give you uh, one last try. One last message. One last moment. I, I'm, just, I'm just not convinced. I, I've, I've been hurt. I, I'm, I'm dealing with so much right now in my life. God seems aloof. God, would you reveal yourself to that person? Father, if there's people here that have not committed their lives to you just yet, I pray that today will be the day of salvation. If if you don't know don't know where your eternity lies today don't leave without talking to someone I'll be up at the front come forward share your heart share your frustrations God, move in and through this church, in and through these people, in and through our families, in and through this community. Holy Spirit, light a fire within our souls. Have your will in your way. Father God, Pour us out of ourselves and fill us up with more of you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Woo. Wow. Whew. God is good, amen? Amen. Well, I just want to let you know, um, next week we will be having an all-church meeting right after the service. Uh, some of you are like, what? What's, what's this all about? Um, so in May of this past year, uh, I attended General Council for the Christian Missionary Alliance. It's basically our, our big, um, it's our big national um, meeting that happens every other year. This time was in Spokane, Washington. A uh, beautiful place. Um, very nice to be there. Uh, but this was a pivotal moment and a critical moment within the history of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Um, there was some decisions and votes that were cast and made. Um, some were on our statement of faith, but others were on uh, practical purposes such as women in ministry, the ordination of women, and titling of pastor and different things like that. And so uh, it's been a couple of months, uh, but I have been wanting to try and get as many people together as possible. And, and summers are just crazy. Everybody's on vacation at different times. And so uh, we just wanted to let you know. I've talked, we met with the elders on June 22nd. 
we discussed this, but this is just a, a starting uh, dialogue, open dialogue of, of the decisions that were made, how that affects our denomination as a whole, but also the, our local church. And so I'm going to be talking about that briefly. I'll give you guys time. If you have any questions, I'll try and answer them as best as possible. But again, that's next week. Um, what it means for the denomination as well as what it means for us as the local church. So uh, just keep that in mind. If you can make it, great. It's going to be right after church, right after the service, right in here. Um, and then uh, we'll go from there. So be praying about that also, too. Um, just I've been planning it for the past uh, two weeks, uh, and I'm just going to put, uh, put it all down and we're going to talk and share and discuss, and really what I want this to be is just an open conversation uh, between me, the leadership, the staff, the elders, and the governing board, as well as all who attend, okay? So that's where we're going to go uh, next week on the 20th. So how did you do last week? How did you do last week? From last week's message, I challenged you in trusting God for what's to come. We talked about our wealth and possessions. Did you find ways to give out of a sacrifice? Maybe you donated money to a charity. Maybe this week you reconsidered what your tithing looks like to the local church. How did that phrase over and above resonate with you? And maybe it was not just your money, maybe it was your time. Maybe it was uh, your importance or, or what you emphasized. Maybe, uh, as in regards to your time, maybe you volunteered at a soup kitchen or you helped with the youth yard sale the last couple of days. Uh, your neighbor needed help painting their garage or finishing a project. What did it look like for you this past week to give out of sacrifice. That's what's so fascinating about generosity. It can become contagious. Who knows uh, when the campaign began, but everybody knows and has heard about the random acts of kindness that we call paying it forward, right? Pay it forward. Someone helps you, and you in turn help someone else, and that person helps someone else, and that's what makes the world go round. When Anne Marie and I started uh, the, the Sweethearts Dinner fundraiser, we would send out thank you letters to all the businesses that would contribute and help to the event. And it never failed. I would write each letter and end it with Proverbs 11.25. And it says this, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. I must say, though, I really appreciate the NRSV translation of this verse. It says this, A person, a generous person will be enriched, and one who gives water will get water. Water? Really? That seems basic, right? A lot of the times when we think of generosity, there's this hierarchy of giving. What did that person give compared to what I gave? I gave this much, but they only gave that much. I mean, everyone can recall that encounter that Jesus has with the religious leaders and the widow in Luke 21, 1 through 4. It says this, while Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. For they have given, look at this at the end here, they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. You see, Jesus was describing to them the generosity of importance. We could ask ourselves right now, okay, with what the rich were putting in, their tiny part of surplus, was it important to them? Is surplus always important? And yet this poor widow, Jesus said, she has given everything, everything that meant something. Everything that was important, everything that mattered, everything to me sounds like she gave out of sacrifice. 
Today we're going to look at the second half of this particular passage of the gifts that were given for building the temple. And remember, David asked last week, who's willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? And the leadership responds. And they give way beyond their means. They give not just in quality, quantity now, but they give in quality. David and all the people rejoice greatly, but what happens next is pretty incredible. We see the generosity of importance take place. Remember, I shared uh, this sermon series with one truth and one question, and the truth is everything is God's, right? Amen? Everything is God's, and that's what we'll look at today. And the And we'll witness that today. And the question is, will you trust God for what's to come? So with that being said, please turn with me into your Bibles to 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 20. 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 20. First Chronicles 29, 10 through 20. We're going to look at verses 10 through 13. And the first point is unscripted prayer. Unscripted prayer. The word of the Lord says this. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Growing up in the church my entire life, there's been one thing that I have constantly struggled with since I came to Jesus. A consistent personal devotions time that doesn't seem forced or routine. Anybody else have that situation? Come on, raise your hand. Yeah. And listen, I have tried everything. Everything. I've devoted a certain amount of time to prayer and the reading of God's word, but there have been moments it just seemed compliant. As if I knew what I had to do and I did it because that's what was expected of me as a Christian. I remember times when I would barter with God on how much time I spent in prayer and study because I was in college and in seminary and felt as if I never closed my Bible. It was open all the time. I was always studying and preparing and reading, and I got to insert this one. I wasn't sure if God was going to let me do this, but he is. And, and, and there's been two times in my life. I was in seminary, okay, and, and I, I'm just giving you this for free. But there is nothing, nothing, nothing better than being in God's Word and devotions. Listen, I, I don't have a problem with version app because I use that from time to time. I don't have a problem with our daily bread. That's great. My grandmother did it for her whole, entire life. It's a blessing. But listen, nothing beats reading God's Word. And so I remember when I was in seminary, I had this devotional-like thing that I was going through, and it had one scripture passage. If you're willing to do that, I just give you this as just, I encourage you, If you're going to just read that, right, whatever day it's for, read, if it comes from Matthew 15, you know, read all of Matthew 15, not just that one verse that it gives. That's just an encouragement to you, okay? Um, So that was in seminary, and God just called me back to the Word of God. Don't worry about that. Focus on this, right? And so then, but then this past year, right, we're walking through the Gospels during communion. You remember this? Yeah, I got into the routine again of, of, of doing the apps and doing all this different stuff. And God said, get back to the Word. And so believe it or not, how many of you have a, you have a bulletin? Somebody has a bulletin? 
Actually, I have one right here. This is from a couple, a couple weeks ago. But to be honest, you see how it says daily Bible reading plan on the back of this? I don't know how many of you have noticed this, but I did in January, and I devoted my life, or, or this year, to do this in a different translation. Maybe that's what God's calling you to do. And you'll go through the entire Bible as you walk through this. So that's, that's what I've done. I've, I've tried everything, right? My prayer life has fluctuated. How many of you, your prayer life has fluctuated before? Raise your hand. Come on, right? I've done prayer walks around the block multiple times. I've done prayer that included silence and solitude, incremental silence from two minutes all the way up to ten minutes, tops for multiple days and weeks on end. I've done journaling. I've prayed prostrate. I've prayed on my knees, eyes closed, eyes open. I've, hand, I've had my hands raised when I pray. I've, read, I've prayed aloud. I've done immediate prayers. I've given promises to pray for others. Midnight prayers, morning and evening, and even in the middle of the night prayers. I've prayed, you ready for this? Some of you all are going to gasp. I've prayed even dozing off to sleep. I've read prayers, scripted prayers that would communicate a heartfelt desire, but I have always felt if they're not fresh words and spontaneous, then how can they be genuine? See, all of this stuff I've gone through. But then there have been those moments. You know what I'm talking about? They just, well, they're just different. I remember praying in my office one time over a family member who had just found out they had cancer. Wow. There's no way that moment of prayer could have been scripted. It was powerful and moving and emotional, yet confident and grounded at the same time. Another moment I remember was when we were in the Dominican and our, uh, our group leader asked somebody to pray. It was after our devotional time and the Spirit prompted me and you just knew it was different. Have you had those moments in your life? Those unscripted prayers that are raw and genuine and packed with power and emotion and expression and confidence and yet maybe even includes desperation and surrender and confession. If you ask me, this prayer that David prays in these first four verses that we're looking at, it's unscripted. I mean, we do see similarities to the Psalms that he wrote. The, the language may be the same, but listen, the prayer that he prays right here, the prayer that comes from the lips and heart of David is vocalized here in a way that probably left every single person in awe and wonder. And the truth that David announces through this prayer is undeniable. And I just want to highlight a few of them for us today. First, his introductory statement is packed with praise. David proclaims God's power and authority and eternal equality. Praise or quality. Praise to you, he says, the God from everlasting to everlasting. There is no question. There is no hesitance. Hesitancy. Next, he gives credit where credit is due. Our human, listen, our human nature tends to want us to focus on self, right? Look who I am, look what I've done. And to be honest, it wouldn't really be shameful for David at this point to take this approach because he is king after all, but he doesn't. Instead, the next three statements begin with yours, Lord. The emphasis and focus is not on David or on anyone else, but on God and God alone. 
He says, your Lord, yours Lord, greatness, power, glory, majesty, and splendor. Hallelujah! Everything in heaven and on earth is yours, he says. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted over all. Then David naturally admits to God's generosity of importance. Ah, here it is, right? David wants to make it known among all the Israelites. Listen, it is no secret that our God is great and mighty, but generosity... That just doesn't seem like a God-like characteristic, but it is. And David wants to impress this upon the Israelites. Wealth, he says, wealth and honor come from you. Nothing is taken or earned or entitled. No, 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 no. All wealth and honor, all of it comes from God. He is the ruler. He is sovereign over all. Do you know that today? Do you believe that today? It's one thing to know, but it's another thing to believe. Do you believe that God is sovereign over all? Amen. And what David confesses next is fascinating. He says it's all in God's hands. David uses this anthropomorphic language to add character and a personal touch. It's in God's hands. And then he says, that's where strength and power comes from. It comes from you. It comes from God. You know, I wonder how many of these people are standing here listening to David's prayer and nodding their heads in agreement. I wonder how many of them can relate to this unscripted prayer. I mean, can you relate to this? Have you seen the greatness and power of God in your life? What about his generosity towards you and your family? Have you confessed that all wealth and honor come from God? My prayer is that if you have, you'll be able to confidently proclaim what David says next at the end of this verse. He says, now we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Second, let's look at verses 14 through 17. A humble and honest confession. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand and all of it belongs to you. I know my God that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Did you know that there's such a thing as false humility? In fact, some would say that false humility is just another expression or form of pride. We know that pride is... One of the seven deadly sins, it's an abomination to the Lord. Pride is the very antithesis of humility. Have you ever met someone that said something, but it clearly was not lining up with the way they were acting? This is going to get a little personal here, right? Yeah, a little too much. They tried to encourage you or say something to you that, quite frankly, they really wouldn't mind if it didn't work out. Does that make sense? Like that co-worker, that worker that, that says that he'll put in a good word or they're cheering you on for that promotion, but really they've got some reservations or ulterior, ulterior, ulterior motives. That's false humility. I hope you get it. I hope it works out for you. 
All the while, they won't lose sleep if the deal falls through, if you have to learn the hard way, or it just wasn't in the cards. False humility. Listen, as followers of Jesus, we should desire a deeper sense of humility. And we need to, we need to recognize false humility in our own lives and ask forgiveness and turn from it. Maybe we need to take it a step further and, and seek reconciliation with someone. Andrew Murray wrote, I love this. Humility is the disappearance of self in the vision that God is all. I like that. And that's exactly how I describe this humility and honest confession that comes from David in these verses. David cannot stop giving praise to God. Everything is God's. That it's, that it's from him and for him. This is not a moment of false humility in David's part. He expresses his, his gratitude and praise to the God who rightfully deserves it. And David doesn't skip a beat. He asks this rhetorical question that places all of the focus and emphasis back on God. He says, who am I? Who are my people? Who are we? We're, we're foreigners and strangers. We're not a people that are deserve, who deserve the generosity that's been given to us, let alone the generosity that we were able to give back. Here it is, but you know what? I think at times... I think at times the obvious is so obvious that it becomes strangely unclear. Does that make sense? Yes, we know that everything comes from God. We know that it's all for God. But there are seasons and moments in our life that somewhere along the way we tend to lose sight of that truth. And we begin to second guess or doubt or come become anxious over what God is providing or will provide. Right? David says here, everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. As if we may have thought through false humility that we have earned or accumulated our wealth and possessions from anything but God, this is a fresh reminder what we have given comes only from the hand of God. But what got my attention the most is what David says at the end of verse 15. He says this, Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. A woman by the name of Bronnie Ware wrote a book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. From her time as a palliative care nurse, she had spent multiple hours with people who would confess to her certain regrets in their life. And that if they could go back, they'd do it all over again and they'd change it up. They'd, they'd change the way they lived, which it, it, it took their imminent death to reveal all of this, Right? to get to these regrets. And the number one regret that Bronnie says in her book is this. I wish I'd had changed, I'm sorry, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. You know what influences others' expectations of us? Wealth and honor. How much we have, who we are and who we know. Unfortunately, many people have defined themselves by what they have and who they know rather than by what and who God says of them. What their life, listen, oh man, this is, this is going to hit. Ready? What their life has amounted to, please get this, 
has been the influence to work even harder to portray what people expect them to become. Did you get that? People are influenced by that to work even harder to portray someone that people expect them to be. And where does that leave us? Living life out of a posture of false humility. In other words, just as David so blatantly said, a life that is shadowed without hope. And, and, but thank the Lord that this humble and honest confession from David leads again to joy and praise. The second part of verse 17 highlights this generosity of importance that we have been talking about. And just in case anyone was doubting the intention of David's heart or he's just doing this for PR purposes or to boost his followers or morale, he confesses this. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Okay, here we go. Have you ever met someone who gave something and yet in the next moment seems to regret it? I mean, I'll, I'll give if I have to. I'll share some if, if need be. All the while, complaint is masked by passive-aggressive or maybe awkward conversations. If you think about it, this happened amongst the church in Corinth. A generous gift was promised to Paul and his companions, but it was never given. So Paul has to write a letter, and Paul notes to them, So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. And then, just to make sure Paul is clear about this, he writes in the next two verses this. He says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will reap also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And at this point, we may be thinking, Ah, Paul, you truly have a way with words, <laughs> right? Can you imagine what it would have been like to read this aloud to the believers in Corinth for the very first time? Drop jaws, gasps, crossed arms, expressions of, of disgust maybe, clearing throats, pointed fingers everywhere, wide eyes, or maybe, just maybe, burdened hearts and hanging heads. But don't miss verse 11. Paul assures them of the generosity of importance. He says this, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Notice now, notice that Paul doesn't say you'll be remembered by what you gave people. Not even. He doesn't even say, you'll be honored amongst the people. No, he says your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Let me ask you today, as we trust God for what's to come, will you devote your generosity of what God has given to you so that the result is thanksgiving to Him? In other words, will you give out of a posture of humility and honesty? Lastly, let's look at this real quick. A bold request and a reverent praise. Verses 18 through 20. 18 through 20. Lord, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever. And keep their hearts loyal to you and give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, statutes, and decrees, and to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. 
Then David said to the whole assembly, Praise the Lord your God. So they all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed down, prostrating themselves before the Lord and the king. My favorite part of this passage has got to be this bold request that David seeks from God. It's twofold. Of course, we can sense a vulnerability on David's part. Like any parent, one of the most feared and dreaded moments in our lives is when we realize that our children have become independent. Maybe for some of you, you're like, no way, man. I'm glad they're out of the house now, right? Well, maybe. Now, independence is a good thing, but come on. If we could make their choices and decisions up until a certain age, and even beyond that age sometimes, right? It'd be fantastic. But there's a moment of imperfection when we realize that my child, listen, my child is going to live this way or choose this regardless of my opinion, authority, or influence. Isn't that hard? It's tough. There's a sobering verse found in the Bible that distinguishes this moment for us. It comes from Romans 14, 12. It states this, So then, each one of us will give an account of ourselves to God. As a youth pastor, I made sure that the youth and young adults understood this passage. It places ownership and accountability on every single person. This doesn't say, I'll be standing with Nora and Noah speaking on behalf of them. Anne Marie and my mentors or other family members won't be standing behind me at this point in my life. Your friends won't be able to vouch for you according to Romans 14, 12. It's just going to be you and God. So David takes advantage of this. He requests from God that first he will keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. Basically, he asks God for assurance that their commitment and loyalty will be established and eternal. David is immovable and passionate about this request. He says, hey, listen, keep them, God. Keep their desires and their thoughts and hearts. Hold on to them long after he's gone. And at this point, you can see it's out of David's hands. This request that he asks of the Lord, he knows that he cannot do anything else. Since he'll be long gone, David has to put his complete trust and faith in God that he will keep his promises and see them through. He asks, give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, statutes, and decrees and to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. Listen, David, here in this moment, this request, he does not ask for more wealth, more strength, or power for Solomon, or even wisdom. No, he asks for a wholehearted devotion to follow through on the promises that God gave him. And it's as if David relinquishes all control here. All control. I mean, he's already given God all he has, right? Wealth and possessions wise. And now, this is the next best thing. He releases control. He offers up his son, Solomon, and the generations of Israel that will come. He's done his part to give generously back to God. He's prayed for a desire and a devotion for God from the people. What's done is done. At this point, he needs to trust God for what's to come. And I love it because the way that this passage started is the way it ends. 
Then David said to the whole assembly, Praise the Lord your God. And the people broke out into this reverent praise. It says actually that they bowed down, prostrating themselves before the Lord and King. Listen, they didn't just kneel. They didn't just kneel before God. They laid their face down to the ground. This was a sign of reverence and submission and surrender. They were just as David did with his son Solomon, releasing control. As we close today, can I ask you, what is it in your life that you need to give to God to release control of? Maybe it is your finances. Maybe it's your family, your marriage, your children, your job, your ministry. Maybe it's your future. Maybe it's your hobbies and possessions. Maybe it's your safety and health. Maybe God is calling you to go somewhere or do something that is way out of your comfort zone. How will you respond? How will you respond? Better yet, will you trust God for what's to come? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for this message. Lord, it's going to